Hi everyone, um, thank you for being here this morning. Um, it's midnight my time, so if I start to slow down, please bear with me um, or try to excite me. Um, anyway, I'm a sociologist, as Claudia had mentioned. Um, I also have affiliations with the Urban Studies Program um, and the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity and the Center for Poverty and Inequality at Stanford. Um, my research interests are in urban sociology, race and ethnicity, immigration, and inequality. Um, so that's just to give you some context about who I am as a researcher. Um, my research is primarily on how urban changes in American cities shape and are shaped by racial and class inequality and segregation. Um, and my primary focus has been gentrification. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, just urban, give you an urban sociology 101 kind of crash course and then talk about um, the theoretical and empirical motivations for, for using vis multimedia data in urban sociology and then I'll walk you through a project that I'm working on um, as well. So by the end of this session, um, I hope that you will be able to explain the value of visual data for urban sociology, um, identify uses of big visual data for urban sociology, uh, recognize the limitations of big visual data, and integrate lessons from working with big visual data into developing and assessing your own work. So I think a lot of these applications, what I'm going to be talking about is urban sociology, but I think there's applications in all social sciences. Um, presumably we're all in the, um, with, uh, have the goal of being computational social science scientists, so I hope these are relevant to you. Um, so as I mentioned, I will start with soci urban sociology 101. Um, in five minutes and tell you about the importance of the study of place. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about systematic social observation um, and I'll take you through the intellectual empirical history of that in the social sciences. Um, and it's an analytical approach uh, that we use to think about spatial context. Um, and then I'm going to talk about urban sociology in the digital age. Um, and then I will go talk you through my project about scaling SSO, systematic social observation. Um, and then I'll end with summary and some discussion um, among all of you. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions for clarification. I tend to talk fast. Um, and so feel free to stop me and have me repeat things um, as I go on. So are there any sociologists in the room? Oh, nice. OK, good. So some of this might be um, basics for you. <laughs> All right, well, for anyone who's not a sociologist, um, this is just a very broad catch-all definition. It's the study of so society, social aggregation, social lives and social behaviors, and interactions and relationships. So it's really about the social, um, and I think that distinguishes it from other social sciences um, that have different units of analysis. Okay. Foundations of Urban Sociology. So it was officially founded, established as a subfield in 1915, uh, but many consider W.E.B. Du Bois' book, The Philadelphia Negro, which was published in 1899 as the first study of urban sociology. Um, and this was a case study of a black neighborhood, in, well actually just a neighborhood in Philadelphia, and he was really studying the black community in this neighborhood. Um, and what makes this unique, this study so, um, so foundational, was that he really established um, the analytical approach that we take as urban sociologists to the study of place. Uh, so he went around and basically conducted his own census with his students. They collected information on all the people that lived there, um, information about their occupations, their socioeconomic status, um, the family structures that were there. Uh, he mapped and documented all the different churches, the different housing structures, um, businesses, uh, and, and essentially created his own survey before the, created his own census um, with his students before the census existed. He also interviewed black residents. Um, and so this was really like the heart of the study of place, right? Taking demographic data, um, interviewing people, and using this to understand the context <coughs> of a place. Uh, borrowing from these ideas, the Chicago School uh, laid the foundation for urban sociology. Um, Robert Park, who's pictured over there, um, published in 1915 um, an essay called The City, um, and it was published in the American Journal of Sociology, which is one of the leading journals um, in sociology, and at the time, the, the leading journal. Um, and there he kind of posed a series of questions 
um, and topics for the study of cities. So he argued that um, we should be thinking about temporal and spatial aspects of cities, differentiation, characteristics of space, um, organizational units like schools and families, uh, the formation and causes of cities and growth and neighborhoods, um, talk about the labor market, the transmission of ideas, crowds. Um, so there's, it's really just a long list of, of things that we could study about the city. Um, and then also the justification for why we want to study cities um, in particular. So he argued that uh, proximity um, in cities were closer together um, and interdependence really um, intensified the effects of social interactions and human behaviors. Um, and so he, he argued that the city is a laboratory in which we could study um, human social relationships, human behaviors. Um, and so that was sort of the foundation of urban sociology. Ten years later, with Ernest Burgess, who is the, the guy on the right, they published a book called The City Together um, in 1925. Um, and here they continued to lay out the foundations of what urban sociology should be. Uh, but they also conceptualized the city as this emergent entity, a, a concept on its own that we should study, um, and in just an agglomeration of individuals and social arrangements um, that had emergent properties uh, that we should study separately from the individuals and neighborhoods themselves. Um, and they also argued that the city was a dynamic entity, right? It had interdependent parts and it was changing and that we should really be um, thinking about cities as, uh, as entities of their own that are dynamic and moving and that we can study them. Fast forward um, about 100 years, almost 100 years later, um, urban sociology has, re is, has evolved over time and I think it's much broader than, than what uh, Park and Burgess had defined. Um, so it, why has it developed in different ways? Um, one is cities have, have are much different than they were in 1920, right? So the cities have developed um, differently across the US and across the, the world, um, not just the way Chicago had developed back then. Um, the nature of settlement types have changed. So back then it was really a big focus on the cities and this outward expansion, but now suburbs, exurbs, uh, rural areas are also uh, entities to be studied in their own right. Um, and scholars have also recognized the importance of the political economy. Um, so that had been, so the Chicago School was dominant for the first half of the, the 20th century, but um, they, what a major critique is that they didn't really recognize the issues of power um, and inequality that were really shaping how cities unfolded. And so the political economy approach um, became much more dominant uh, during that time. And so now scholars are trying to in, are integrating these issues of power and inequality into the study, um, but also thinking about context and place um, when we think about urban sociology. Uh, there's also a debate on what is urban. Um, so traditionally, um, as the way uh, Park and Burgess had laid out the, the field, um, urban sociology was specifically about the study of cities. Uh, but I would argue that urban sociology today is not just about issues that are confined to city boundaries um, and the study of the city itself. Urban sociologists are really interested um, also in social life and behaviors in, um, and their relationship to place, not just in a city. They're also interested in differentiation across settlement types, like the city itself, the suburbs, uh, rural areas, and the role of these different settlement types in society. Um, so I think urban sociology is much broader, and I want to be thinking about that as we think about using multimedia data in the study of uh, urban sociology. Um, and so I would argue that sociology is really, or urban sociology is really sociology, right? The study of society and social aggregation, social lives and social behaviors, interactions and relationships, but with particular context to, or particular attention to the spatial and temporal context. Um, so it's really a study about place and time and how things are embedded. Um, and the art, and what the Chicago School had argued was that um, we can't really understand social life without understanding the arrangements of particular social actors in particular spatial and temporal contexts. Um, and so in order to study urban, to, in order to do urban sociology, uh, we have to do some social observation of context to really understand place. Um, 
Some of the general approaches that are, are often used are administrative and survey data, right? Like the census um, is very popular. Other administrative data, um, crime records, um, school data, government data. Um, and then ethnographic methods have been the other um, side of urban sociology. Uh, but also, um, systematic social observation has had a place in urban sociology. So this is direct observation of physical conditions of places or social interactions um, is an important component for understanding social context as well. And as I'll tell you, um, systematic social observation has had a presence in urban sociology, but the data has been hard to collect, um, and so it hasn't had as much of a present as I think we can have um, with multimedia data and the emergence of big data um, in the field. Okay, so foundations of SSO. It's attributed to Albert Rees, I think I'm saying it right, um, who published two uh, papers in 1968 and 1971 that really laid out the foundation of what SSO is. Um, and it, he uh, it basically established it as a method for studying social phenomenon. And he argued that social scientists needed to capture the sight, sound, and feel of the streets beyond survey, administrative, and ethnographic methods. Um, and he was also a, a criminologist, so his application to SSO had to do with policing, uh, public and policing interactions. Um, and just to put things in intellectual context, this is during a time um, that people would, that is the quantitative turn in sociology. Um, and so some part of this was kind of a pushback to ethnographic methods um, and, and how can we quantify the things that we uh, use to study the sight, sounds, and feel of places. And he argued we could do this directly by observing the physical conditions and social interactions um, through systematic rules and procedures. Um, he argued that we could have these rules written out um, and that different observers would observe the same thing rather than in ethnographic methods or in, in the qualitative interviews where you're interviewing someone and you just ask them how, how much disorder do you think is in this neighborhood. Uh, he would thought we could have systematic, he argued that we could have systematic rules and procedures for documenting how much disorder is in a neighborhood. Um, and so the emphasis was really on the independence of the observer from the observations with objectivity as the goal. Um, and it, the important part of this is that we can duplicate the measures across observers, um, as he argued, and that we're picking up something, these perceptions, uh, or we're picking up uh, something about the place that are distinct from the perceptions of a place. And in, 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 this, in his publication, he argued, he laid out the, the way we would um, execute SSO, and I think this is important to think about as we're thinking about using SSO in the age of uh, big data, right? So he argued that you need to have a problem selection, right? So you select your problem, you do some preliminary investigation, and then you define the universe and sample of places that you're going to observe. Um, you develop an instrument, a, essentially a survey instrument, um, and a, a method for how you're going to measure the error. Um, so again, this is like, taking how we, our survey methods um, from traditional surveys, but using them to think about surveying places. Um, we pretest the instructions, organize the data collection, process the observations, um, and analyze. And so the, the key here is that it's, these are systematic methods, ap applying survey methods to surveying a place, um, and then assessing our measures, which things that you can't necessarily do, um, although there are ways, um, with ethnographic methods. So this was a, a way to think about observing a place, getting that sights, those sight sounds and feel of a place without, um, but with, in a more systematic way. Okay, so brief review of SSO and social science <coughs> research, um, just so you can see sort of the applications of this um, and why this, what kind of insights we've gained from it. Um, 
So race actually attributes SSO in the social science to in social sciences to um, a study by Lang and Lang published in 1953. Um, they were sociologists, um, and essentially they showed that there's selection in um, TV coverage, and they had observers go to a parade and observe the parade, and then they compared it to um, what was observed on the TV and showed that there was selection in what's covered. Now this seems obvious to us now, but at the time this was a very uh, was an insight that you can get from compare being in a place and observing it versus watching it on TV. Um, and then of course we have Reese's work um, which was focused on policing um, and the public interaction and there's been uh, a lot of applications of his work in policing in criminology where people have um, scholars have looked at variation in policing behavior in different neighborhoods, um, how police mobilize in different places, how officers spend their time um, and so it's been widely picked up, uh, used in um, criminological research. Uh, some sociologists and um, psychologists have used it um, in the 80s to conduct some studies where they had conducted street audits where people went around to neighborhoods um, and observed physical decay, observed land use, um, and then they also asked people about the physical decay, um, physical disorder in different neighborhoods. Um, and essentially what they found was that there is a correlation between perceived disorder and actual disorder. Um, and then they also found that there's differences with percep uh, perceptions affect neighborhood trajectories. I'm sorry, not perceptions. Um, the physical decay of neighborhoods affect neighborhood trajectories. So if a neighborhood looks like it's declining, people tend to disinvest in it and um, it continues to decline. Um, and these were some of the insights they got from just a few places. Um, it, uh, in which they conducted SSO. Okay, so the next piece was sort of a um, revolution at the time, um, by, uh, was the data collection of, um, by, uh, by the PhDCN, which is the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. Um, this was a huge multi-pronged study where they followed individuals over time. Um, uh, they had three waves of surveys of these families. They also conducted community surveys where they went around to different neighborhoods and um, asked people about the, um, their perceptions of the neighborhood, about disorder in the neighborhood, um, of what they see, saw as how much crime was in the neighborhood. Um, and then they conducted SSO. And so what they did was they took a camcorder and they ha held it out of a window of a car and drove around Chicago neighborhoods. Um, and then they record, then they went back and coded those, those images or those videos for different indicators of different streets. Um, and uh, some different insights that uh, came out of this project um, was that physical and social disorder are correlated with perceptions, but it's actually, they find that it's actually mediated by racial context. So people tend to perceive a neighborhood as having more disorder um, when there, it would, had more minorities in the neighborhood. Um, they also put broken windows theory to a, the test, to a test. So broken windows theory, uh, the idea there is that um, physical disorder and social disorder invite more crime and more violence um, because it indicates to others that there's um, indifference in the neighborhood and that it's a place to, that you can commit more crime. Um, and so what they find is that um, Actually, physical disorder and social disorder and crime are all correlated and what's really causing those are the lack of collective efficacy in the neighborhood. Um, so they argue that, um, they find that small amounts of disorder is not actually what's causing violence um, and, and in these neighborhoods. Um, and even though they, they find this, broken windows policing, which is aggressive policing against small levels of disorder, is widely used um, in US cities at least. Um, when, in, when we think about uh, policing. So even though they test this theory in Chicago, they have one point in time, it's during the 90s, um, and it hadn't, hasn't really caught wind um, among a lot of police departments in the US. Um, and then another study that came out of this using the SSO um, was looking at uh, commercial decline. Uh, so they look at decay and decline in commercial buildings, and they find that in neighborhoods with more uh, levels of commercial decline, there were higher mortality rates during the Chicago heat wave uh, in 1995. Um, and so there's this correlation or there's this relationship between the physical environment and health um, 
in, in, in these in Chicago neighborhoods. Uh, the next, another study that's come out of this has been used by, in public health and epidemiology. Um, it, was a spa it was called SPACES. I actually forget what the acronym stands for. Um, but essentially, they were looking at um, streets and sidewalks and um, different aspects of the physical environment. And they, they look at how this is related to physical activity. Um, so SSO can tell us about the built environment. Um, and then we can learn things about accessibility uh, for physical activity and how that affects health as well. Um, and then finally, there's been another study in LA um, in criminology where they're just looking at land use and crime with SSO. So people were going around the streets documenting land use. Um, and they found that in mixed use uh, neighborhoods rather than in, in neighborhoods with all commercial use, there were lower rates of crime in LA. Okay, so as I had alluded to, there's been an evolution of SSO. Um, traditionally, people go around with clipboards, they fill out this survey, and you walk around streets to observe a neighborhood. Um, and then the PhDCN um, had a camcorder, um, which at the time was very revolutionary. By holding a camera outside of the car, they were able to record many more streets than having people go and walk around to neighborhoods. Um, so this saved a lot of time and labor costs that go into um, the old way of doing SSO. Um, another benefit of this was we could check reliability, right? So the images are actually recorded rather than people walking on streets and taking notes uh, and filling out the survey. Um, we can actually look at the video capture and see what, how the raters are doing, if they're rating things correctly or not. Um, and the other benefit of the camcorder version of the study was that they could control the time of day and the day of the week that they went to different neighborhoods. So they had, um, in their research design, they uh, varied the time of day um, and day of the week that they went to different places. And, and especially with social disorder, which is like people hanging out on blocks or um, the noises that go on there, uh, that, those are things that vary by from five in the morning to midnight, right? So um, they were able to vary this and adjust for this in the statistical models um, afterwards. However, um, this was in Chicago only. It was in 1995. It was still very time and labor intensive. Um, so it cost a lot of money to do. Um, and they only were able to do a, small, a stratified subsample of neighbor, a stratified sample of neighborhoods. Um, so still uh, limited. Um, the other thing is that they record, they um, filled out the surveys with 120 indicators, but as I mentioned, like only a few seem to be used. So again, a lot of time went into it. Um, not all things were useful um, as well. Okay, so it's fast forward a couple, many years. Um, so Google Street View came out um, in 2009, and that's really changed the way we can think about SSO, right? Because they're essentially doing what the PhDCN did, um, but it, Google did it, um, so it doesn't cost researchers money. Um, and it's going around with a camcorder, and it's many more, much more street coverage, right? Um, so how many, has everyone used Google Street View? Yes? Okay. Um, have any of you used it for academic purposes? Oh, you, you got, I, you're, the, you're here <laughs> as presenters. Anyone else? Um, what, it, what do people normally use it for? <laughs> right, where, where, you, where you live, where you're going, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. When I went to, um, you know, when I'm flat hunting in London, I want to check the outside of a flat. Which is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you check the streets around it too? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it saves some time, right? Um, and then also we're observing a place, seeing if it's a good, if we want to live there. Um, and now I'm frozen. OK. All right, so since the 2009 release, um, social scientists have begun to employ Google Street View into their research um, as a tool for SSO. Um, so my research um, during graduate school was, in, I was interested in um, what factors predicted the degree to which neighborhoods gentrified. 
Um, I called it GGO, um, Google Gentrification Observations, um, as a play on SSO. Um, and essentially what I was interested in were what are the different indicators of gentrification and the degree of it. And so I was looking for um, the lack of physical disorder, um, beautification efforts, and then and, um, evidence of new construction or renovation in neighborhoods. So I, um, different ways of investing in a neighborhood. So this is by maintenance, um, just beautification efforts, things like that, lack of physical disorder, but also the idea of investment um, and reinvestment in a neighborhood. Um, and essentially what I found was that, um, what we found was that after controlling for proximity to amenities in downtown, controlling for prior levels of gentrification that were conduct, um, from field surveys that were conducted in the 90s, um, controlling for socioeconomic status and for crime, uh, we found that perceived disorder and percentages of African Americans um, had a negative effect on the degree to which neighborhoods gentrified. So these are neighborhoods that started to gentrify in the 90s or were adjacent to them, and the, if they had above a certain percentage of African Americans, they gentrified much slower. And so we were able to pick up this variation across neighborhoods in the level of gentrification um, in a neighborhood at a particular time. Um, there's also been another uh, set of studies by a group um, at the Columbia School of Public Health. So these are epidemiologists, um, public health groups, um, called CANVAS. Um, it stands for Computer Assisted Neighborhood Visual, uh, Visual Assessment System. Right. Um, and so they created a module um, across multiple cities where you could go use Google Street View and fill out different questions about a neighborhood, um, and they, one of the findings that they had from this study, this is still an ongoing project, was that there's racial and ethnic inequality and exposure to physical disorder among elderly individuals. Um, and the study looked at Detroit, New York, Philadelphia, and San Jose. So they, they're doing multiple cities um, at one point in time, and they're looking at physical disorder in different neighborhoods. Another um, group that's been working with Google Street View is called Adapt Lab, and this is um, headed by Candace Odgers, who's a psychologist and neuroscientist at Duke. Um, and she's looking at how neighbor features affect health um, through the brain. And then she's also been doing some twin studies and looking at the neighborhood environments um, following twins over time. Um, so that's been cool research. And then there's been another study by, or another set of studies by geographers Langston and Steenbeck. Um, and they were looking, using Google Street View to look at different indicators of surveillance um, on houses. And essentially what they find are that in neighborhoods where there are more surveillance indicators, there's a lower risk of burglary. So they seem to be effective, or at least there's a correlation there. Okay, so. Google Street View enables us to save a lot of time and labor costs compared to going around in the streets and taking surveys, um, but it still takes a lot of time. Um, so, like an immense amount of time. So I can just tell you from the Google Street View gentrification observations, I only surveyed one-sixth of the census tracts in Chicago, um, and I only surveyed a sample of blocks within those um, census tracts. So I, I surveyed maybe a few thousand blocks, thousands of blocks, um, and it took, it takes about 15 minutes to do a block, so going around a block, so that's like four street seg three to four street segments, uh, to, in order to navigate to where I want to go um, based on my stratified sampling on Google Street View, then to go around the block and to code things, um, and that's just for me, uh, then let alone testing it, comparing it to the reliability of other people, um, that totaled like, lots of my time, like hundreds and hundreds of hours just at the computer. Um, and so just think that it's not very many, not, not that much coverage, right? Um, Canvas, the, the study from the School of Public Health in Columbia University, um, in one of their papers they say it takes 13 minutes per block face, so that's one street block um, to code, uh, it takes 13 minutes to code that. Um, however, they compared it to um, 
another related study on Detroit uh, where people went around and did street audits because they were looking at the feasibility of using Google Street View for street audits versus Detroit. Um, the Detroit study they calculated was about 4,000 hours to deploy people into the streets to train them and to um, for how much time transportation costs from the University of Michigan is run out of, um, to train them, to have them do the audits, to have more than one person do each street. Um, they calculated that was 4,000 hours, whereas the training for the Google Street View version took um, about 135 hours. So huge time saved, but it still takes 13 minutes per block face to code one for one coder. Um, so still limited. Um, and so as a result, there's still limited temporal and spatial coverage in what Google Street View has provided for social scientists. Um, so in my, in my dissertation work, I was looking at Chicago and Seattle. In both cities, I covered one-sixth of the census tracts. It took a lot of my life um, of sitting at a computer, so um, not much coverage. And at the time, um, I only covered two waves of Google Street View. Um, so now there's like six waves, and it goes up to 2019. And so just keeping up with that is a huge time suck. Um, Canvas only used a handful of cities and had um, a sparse sample of, of um, observations. Uh, and we simply, you know, there, we need new ways of, of using Google Street View that aren't just by hand, um, where are coding um, surveys by hand. Okay, so to deal with this, um, one approach has been Kriging. Um, the Canvas uh, researchers have been using that, and Kriging is essentially a geospatial technique where you're estimating characteristics of a place by smoothing the surfaces of place. So they'll have two points um, in a city. You can measure disorder in those two city two um, in those two points, and then you kind of smooth things out and assume the disorder levels in between. Um, but you know, nothing's actually observed in between these places. It's kind of assuming that there is a smooth surface. Um, and so it's not really great for studying things that we might think have uneven distributions, like gentrification, um, land use, et cetera. Um, you know, space is, uh, space is not evenly distributed, and there's not necessarily a linear um, relationship between two points. Um, so they've, that's how they've kind of been dealing with it, but I think we, and we all know that we need better ways to just observe more. Um, so again, we have continued limitations in existing data for theory and research. Um, you know, we've learned a lot from the street audits, the camcorder version of it, um, and Google Street View, um, but everything's just been on a handful of neighborhoods, specific places, and we don't really have longitudinal data. Um, and so we don't have this fine-grained temporal and spatial coverage or wider geographic coverage. Um, and then as a result, urban sociology still tends to rely on survey and administrative data and ethnographic methods. Um, okay, so in the last decade or so, there's been a massive transformation um, in society and in um, computational methods. Um, and so this is really change the way social scientists can start to think about research and the types of questions we can ask. Um, so we're th rethinking traditional ways of collecting data. So I went through this whole um, history of SSO. So how can we rethink that? Um, but sociologists, I think, maybe more so than others, are, are more skeptical, are very skeptical about these types of data. Um, and there's some uncertainty on what these changes allow us to do. Um, and so, I want you to keep these in mind as we think about, um, you know, the data that I'm collecting. Um, I, I'll show you my skepticism about different things and, um, and how that applies to your own research. Um, okay, so now we're in this rise of big data, right? Um, there's tons of different types of data that um, urban sociologists can really start to think about taking advantage of, or just anyone. Um, we have social media data, right? We have Twitter, um, Nextdoor. Do people know what Nextdoor is? Maybe it's in the US thing. Um, so Nextdoor is an app that you can create with your people in your neighborhood. Um, and you can leave messages. You can, I think, it, I signed up for one day and I got 20 million emails and I, 
unsigned up just to see what was on there. Um, but it's a forum basically between among neighbors. Um, you have Yelp where you can look at different restaurants and businesses, um, Instagram, uh, ways of capturing places, um, Foursquare, um, is Foursquare in, the, in your, okay, yeah, checking into places. Um, there's also been this big move for open governance, right? So a lot of cities are starting to put a lot of their data online with these open data portals. Um, I just put up a few, but pretty much any city that wants to maintain its status ha um, as a city has been creating these open data portals. Um, and it contains things like building permits, um, 311 data. So 311 is um, essentially if you're calling to complain about a pothole or trash not being picked up, you can just call 311 or text it and um, you can take pictures on it now and send it to the city and they'll come pick up the trash or they'll come fix a pothole, supposedly. Um, and then there's this movement of smart cities, right? So uh, um, there's this idea of putting sensors everywhere and, and ca you know, for better transportation planning. Um, so these are new types of data that we can use. And then we have street view data and satellite imagery um, as other ways of thinking about um, studying urban spaces. Um, there's also just been, in general, the rise of big data, the digitization of administrative records. So now it's possible to um, link data securely, link administrative records securely, um, and then there's been advances in how to process big data. Um, so that's been another game changer in sociology. Um, and then there's a shift in how we collect data, right? So there's crowdsourcing um, that's really emerged as a way to collect data um, and to do other, uh, to survey people, run experiments. Um, Anyone have, uh, are there other types of big data that might be useful for urban sociology? Any other ideas? Yeah. Meetup data? What's, it, what's that? Uh, meetup. Oh, yeah, meetup data. Right, yeah, meetup groups. Exactly. Yeah, so there's been a huge proliferation of meetups. Yeah. Um, uh, bike share records. Yeah, bike share records. Good, yeah. That's another great way. So think. Um, transportation records. Yeah, transportation records, right. Now we're tracking. Um, where people are going. Water use. Water use, yep. Satellite imagery. Satellite imagery, yep. Yeah, so lots of different possibilities um, for studying cities or urban places. Um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm really gonna focus on street view imagery um, because that's where my research is. Um, and that's a, a vi as a visual data source. Um, so just to give you some brief history on Google Street View, um, it was, uh, the Google Street View vehicles were deployed in 2007, um, and essentially what they did was they uh, drove around different cities, um, a selection of cities, they had these panoramic cameras that were spinning on top of them, taking images as they drove. Um, in 2009, they launched the, um, the version where you could navigate it online, um, and you could go to a different address, you can navigate it and look at the panoramics of it. And they, what they did was they stitched together different images. So this is the same block um, if you just go down it. Um, and that was sort of, that's the way they've constructed the images. Um, oh yeah, so most, usually it's a car, but they've also done it, they've sent people with bicycles around, they've um, sent people uh, on other, there's other vehicles that they've done. Um, Oh yeah, on foot, um, by boat, um, for any non-accessible areas. So they, there, there is street view imagery um, in places you might not think there would be. Um, sometimes it contains indoor views of businesses. Um, and so while not intentional, it's really a time and labor efficient means of collecting uh, this kind of data that was collected in the 90s with a camcorder. Um, and, it's, and it captures a wide array of places. Um, I think one of the downsides, though, is we can't really control when they collect it, right? And we can't control the time of day. Um, it seems to be that they often do it really early in the morning. Um, but actually, now I've seen vehicles around um, else at other times. But in certain cities, everything will be at the same time, right? So you, there's not really this heterogeneity that we were able to capture with the camcorder studies. Um, but a lot more places. Um, and then in 2014, they released Time Machine. Um, which is the feature where you can look at images over time. Previously, it was just the most recent image um, that was taken, but they have this archive, and so now you can go back and see this same block 
change um, and become condos. Um, and this is a place in Philly that I used to study. Um, so you can then see things change over time. Yeah. Is it dominant for United States or around I think it's all around the globe. I'm not sure, actually. So I know when they first deployed the in 2007, they only went to a handful of cities, um, and then they started adding more and more cities. Um, now it's, they have 83 countries, 10 million miles is what they claimed in 2017. Um, so it's in more countries, uh, but the, sh the time machine might not go back to 2007 as it does in a lot of the US cities where they started um, the project. Yes? Yeah, so it's harder, so Google Earth, so I started with Google Street View because Google Earth didn't have the, um, now you can go to Street View from it. Um, before you couldn't, um, but it is harder for, I think it's harder for scraping um, in terms of the APIs um, and getting the Street View version of it, yeah. But I think if you're doing something like what Canvas does where they're, navigating something and then having you fill out surveys, then that is probably an option. Um, but since they're not doing live, they're not doing scraping, um, or they hadn't been, um, I believe they are now, but yeah. Okay, um, so another big innovation since Street View was released where there's been huge um, in, uh, innovations in computer vision and machine learning. Um, so now we can use imagery data and think of it as data and analyze it um, at a large scale. Um, so I think you probably, this was covered already, but in 2012, people call it the deep learning revolution. So there's been, um, this is when researchers demonstrated that we could speed up processing of neural networks and dramatically improve error rates um, when it comes to machine learning. So now we can recognize objects and characteristics in complex images and can train computers um, to do tasks like photo tagging um, that were easy for humans, but obviously much more time consuming. Um, and essentially, um, did you all already go, you went over deep learning algorithms, multiple layer, right? So you're using multiple layers um, to process uh, characteristics about the image. Um, so within this, there's been um, a development uh, within the um, deep learning uh, called convolutional neural networks. Also, I think you went over this as well. Um, but it's a class of deep neural networks for analyzing visual imagery. It's really changed the way we can think about using images as data. Um, and it provides a machine vision framework um, that we can use. Um, so here we're using, uh, we can then use semantic segmentation, which is essentially partitioning an image into different um, pieces and labeling them. Uh, so this is just a street view image and then the different labels that we put on it. And then we can extract features um, from these different features from these images. Um, and then we can use these to train um, a support vector regression algorithm um, to predict on other images. Um, so SVR, was that covered also? No, okay, so support vector um, regression is essentially used to predict other, um, to predict on other images based on similarities and difference, uh, differences in these features. Um, and it, uh, what's good about it is it can control for, it's, it's better for dealing with model complexity um, and errors uh, in the model. Um, so this is sort of our framework for thinking about um, deep vision uh, learning. All right, so a third major development um, that enables us to use um, imagery uh, as data is crowdsourcing, right? Um, can anyone tell me what crowdsourcing is, abstractly? Why did you lose the power? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, power of people, right. So it's sourcing, it's a sourcing model essentially for getting people, organizations um, to provide ideas, to provide other goods and services, um, often from internet users. Um, uh, and it's often a large cohort, a large uh, pool of people that we're drawing from, um, and it's changing. Um, so it's not this top-down approach where researchers are surveying, picking who they want to sample, every 10 houses or something, and surveying people like that. This we can't really control, right? Um, 
but it's cheap, it's fast and flexible. Um, and these are just some different uses. So information generation, right? The power of the people um, for Wikipedia, right? Um, using it as a survey method. So people do still use um, kind of traditional survey methods with um, Amazon MTurk, um, Amazon, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. But there's been also this development called Wiki Surveys, um, developed by Matt Salganic, who's a sociologist at Princeton. Um, and essentially, they used it, uh, one application of it was for New York City planning. Um, and it was called, they basically gener asked for ideas from different people. So it had open survey questions. And then it automatically picks the top ones and then keeps asking people, like, which one's more important for you? Um, or, and things like that. So it's a way of generating ideas with more open-ended kind of questions um, in a more dynamic way than we traditionally survey people. Um, experiments. So people, a lot of researchers have been using Amazon Mechanical Turk and other um, platforms for running experiments. So you can ask people, you can present um, vignettes or something, you can present a photo, then you can have experimentation by presenting um, manipulations in that photo and asking questions about that. Um, so you can use it for survey experiments as well. Um, and then they're also good for research assistants, which is my use of them. Um, so they do data, you can use them for data cleaning, data labeling, data processing, data verification. Um, and there's several platforms. So there's Microworkers, Crowdflower, um, uh, Open IDEO, Crowdspring, um, and then Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a popular one that, that I draw from in my research. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the applications of computer vision techniques um, with Google Street View, yes? Uh, you like yeah, so it is, it depends on your use of it and your care with it. Um, so there have been, top, high, you know, publications in the top journals using crowdsourcing um, in the experimental versions of it, in surveys um, for opinions, um, but you have to do, you have to show all of the care that you've done. So mechanical Turkers are not, you know, they're, they're, they're limited in what they can do. Um, there's, a pool, you, they, there's a pool of where they come from. They have approval ratings. Um, so like I'll show you, we have qualification tests. We restrict it to 90% <coughs> approval ratings. They also have to get a, a pass our qualification tests. Um, they also have to, we have them only from the US just to control things. Um, and then we have bot checks um, and things like that. So there's like all of these things that you need to do and show. Um, but it's been published in top journal, or it's been used to be um, published in top journals. I think with experiments, it's, um, it's not, I think you need a large sample size. I've seen a lot of experiments being done where there aren't any findings. Um, the crowdsour the MTurkers like know what you're onto a lot of times, so it has to be a really well done experiment. Um, there's, um, issues with, like, is your, is your, um, because there's, this, it, the issue is that there's, they're a specific type of worker. They tend to be um, white, female, um, you know, so they're not representative of the U.S. And so how can we think about that and when we're thinking about experiments is an important thing to consider. Um, but it's used. Um, okay, so computer vision techniques um, have drawn on it. Uh, these are just some examples. So, uh, one uh, set of scholars um, have you looked at sidewalk presence and have looked at the quality of the sidewalks, um, and that's been used in public health uh, and thinking about public health and accessibility and walkability of places, um, also with urban planning. Um, traffic signs, um, have, uh, people have used Google Street View and computational techniques to look at traffic signs, and that's been useful for transportation planning. Um, this is a, uh, a study on perceived safety and predicting socioeconomic status. Um, one of my collaborators on this project is Nikhil Naik, um, and, a, and he used images that were based on crowdsourcing, where they, asked, they presented people with two images, they asked which one looks safer, um, and they collected millions and millions of ratings of images on perceived safety, um, and then used computer vision techniques to predict perceived disorder in different neighborhoods, and then they were able to show that that can predict SES in different places. Um, 
So he also has done a project where he's been looking at urban change over time. So you can take what, you, what we predicted from um, those comparisons of perceived safety, um, but looking at the 2007 and 2014 waves of the Google Street View images, he then could see if there was urban change um, in a particular place. Um, scholars um, at Stanford, Timnit Gabru, um, used computer vision techniques with Google Street View to look, show car identification, and they were able to distinguish between 2,600 different makes and models, which I think is very impressive. Um, and then they could predict the socioeconomic status of places from that. Um, others have looked at greenery um, at using Google Street View and um, automated methods. Others have looked at architectural style to predict home values. Uh, and then finally, another one has looked at um, visual property improvements as an estimate of gentrification. So they're again looking at just changes in, in features of images over time. Um, so these are just some of the applications. Um, okay, so for the rest of this time, I'm just gonna walk you through what I'm doing. Um, I'll talk to you all about the issues. This is very much a work in progress. Um, and I'll tell you about some of the things we came across, some of the things we've changed. I'm um, also happy to hear any ideas that you all may have um, as I go through. Um, okay, so just brief background of the project. I'm interested in capturing the physical disorder and level of maintenance in neighborhoods. Um, why? Physical disorder is the level of deterioration in urban landscapes. Physical maintenance is the degree to which there's order in an urban landscape. And so these are theoretically um, useful things to uh, capture to study uh, urban spaces. Um, why are they important? So theoretically, they, um, they represent like a neighborhood's public presentation of self. Um, they have a lot of symbolism and salience when we think about places. As you mentioned, you look around at a place, right, when you're looking at whether or not you want to live there. Um, and so they have important implications for places because they shape perceptions. Um, people make decisions on whether or not to invest in those places or move into them. Um, physical disorder and maintenance shapes behavior. Other studies have shown that when there's a lack of physical disorder, there's lack of activism um, as a result. Um, and environment, it's also um, physical disorder and maintenance have been shown to be environmental stressors um, for, for individuals and um, so that has concerns with public health. Um, and then there's this question of whether or not it attracts more crime uh, as well. So these measures, um, by having these measures, I can start to answer some sociological questions. A lot of those other, as all those other studies that I've mentioned don't really use, are not really sociological studies. So what kinds of sociological questions can I ask? Um, how and why do neighborhoods change physically over time? Um, what factors are predicting this heterogeneity in how neighborhoods change? Um, how do physical neighborhood conditions affect individual and community level health? Um, how do physical neighborhood conditions relate to perceptions and satisfaction of neighborhood environments? Um, and then how does physical neighborhood change relate to neighborhood demographic change? So these are questions about gentrification and displacement, um, dis decline and disinvestment uh, in neighborhoods and depopulation. Uh, so these are all questions that I plan to answer once I'm done collecting these data. Um, so a first order question then is to what extent can we automate procedures to measure physical neighborhood conditions at scale? So all of those questions previously we couldn't really answer, or only answered with data at one point in time, or we couldn't answer because there's really not much data on the physical conditions of places. Um, so the goal in this project is to develop a method to reliably measure physical disorder and decay and the degree of physical maintenance of neighborhoods at a large scale and over time. Um, so what we want to collect are reliable measures of physical disorder. So we're focusing in this project on trash, blighted buildings, and unkept frontage. So frontage is just the exterior space that's not, uh, we're calling it frontage, but that's not a great name. It's just the non-building uh, area of maintenance. Um, and then reliable measures of trash levels, um, the conditions of buildings, frontage conditions. Um, and then we want to think about neighborhoods pretty flexibly, right? So not just census tracts, which are often used um, in studies, and I'm sure there's other equivalents in respective countries. Um, street, but we want to think about smaller aggregations because different, different um, aspects of the physical environment might matter at different spatial scales. 
Um, and then we want longitudinal data as well. Um, currently, we're piloting, our pilot cities are Boston, Detroit, and LA um, in the US. Um, we picked these because they're very different architecturally. They have different histories of urban development. And so we want to think about, um, we want our, our, our method to be scalable. So we want to pick cities with different, um, different looks to see how well we can predict on other cities. Um, and then the other goal is that we want objective measures. So I put these in quotes because they're objective in the, in the sense that they're different from asking someone how much disorder and maintenance is in your neighborhood or asking someone how safe a, an image looks. Um, but there's still some uh, subjectivity when it comes to um, getting these objective measures. And I'll show you some examples of this um, as we go along. Um, so these are just some examples. So this is an image with a lot of trash. I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, this is a blighted building, a sported up. And then this is an example of, image of an image with unkept frontage, so a lot of overgrown weeds. Um, and then here are some oh, images of high maintenance, right? So this is a clean, lo low levels of trash, um, a, a well-kept building, and a well-maintained frontage area. So we want to be able to distinguish between these different types of images. Um, so this is just the process that we're working with. Um, so first, we have to scrape all of the images. Um, then we need to pre-process them. Uh, so not all of the images, when you scrape them, they're not perf perfectly set to how we want them. They can be blurry. Um, there's a bunch of other issues that I'll, I'll show you. Um, so then we need to pre-process them. Then we need to collect the training data. Um, and we're using crowdsourcing to do that. Um, and then we need to assess them, um, the reliability of them. So are they actually Cap, uh, are the m -Turkers, um those are the Mechanical Turk workers, um, giving us reliable answers? And are they valid? Are they actually capturing what we want them to capture? Um, so it's an iterative process. Um, then we want to use the training data to um, train a model for, uh, with deep vision learning. Then we have to assess those. So are those models actually predicting what we want them to predict? Are they predicting them consistently? Does it depend on which data is used for the training? Um, once we have those, then we want to aggregate those measures to th at the neighborhood level, the block level, the block group level, census tracts. Um, so aggregate them to different um, neighborhoods. We also want to create scales for physical disorder and physical maintenance. We want to assess those, right? So are those actually capturing those scales, capturing what we want to um, capture? And then we want to be able to scale our method to other cities. Um, and, and uh, be able to look at, be able to apply the method to other cities so that we can look at more cities and um, over time. Okay, so scraping. All right, so when you go to Google Maps, you type in your address, um, and then it, you, it takes you to this. Um, and then you can navigate, if you click on that, then you can navigate to the actual house, right? Um, so how do we get these images and scrape them? Um, and how can we save them for a large number of images? Um, so another thing to think about when we're scraping is we have different indicators of interest. So we want to be changing the camera angle. So for the buildings one, we want to get better images of the building. For trash, we want to be more on the sidewalk. Um, frontage, we want to have like kind of another angle. So we have different, we have a negative 40 angle, degree angle there, is, uh, that's the, the default, um, and then that's um, negative 20 degrees. Um, and then we also want to think about how we can capture the images over time. So the Google Street View API just gives you the current image, um, and there are ways around it, which I'll tell you, but um, we want to be able to capture things over time. Um, so that we can see change. This is actually a house I lived in, and they con did construction on it while I was living there, um, which was terrible. Um, but you want to be able to see the change that's going on um, over time. We are interested in getting images of actual buildings. So what we do is we have a list of all the parcels in the city, which is available on a lot of the open data portals. Um, and then we sample using those parcels um, and to ensure that we have at least four 
locations on each side of a block. Um, other people use grids, um, so you can have grids, you can put a grid over the city and decide where to take images along those grids. Um, but for us, because we want to make sure we're getting the full building, we have this other version of it. Um, and then you can use a geocoder API um, for the US Census, that's how we can track what neighborhood they belong to um, and get their latitude and longitude if we need to, but there's other ways of doing that. Um, so we have to geocode everything. Okay, pre-processing. Okay, so some of the images that we scrape are, even though we have the same parameters, bless you, um, in it, they're not great for what we want to see. So as I mentioned, they go inside restaurants and businesses. Um, sometimes they're blurry, um, so this is pretty bad quality, and that's generally in the 2007 and 2009 images, the quality is not very good because they had different cameras. Um, even though we set the zoom, sometimes we get images like that. Um, even though we set the angle, um, a lot of times at intersections, it'll just be pointing straight down the road. Um, and we ha th so we need to get rid of all these. Um, and then the other issue is obstruction. So if we're asking about trash here, you can't really see the sidewalk because it's being obstructed. Um, however, like that image is okay for looking at frontage. So, um, so some indicators, so some issues are are task specific, like trash buildings or frontage, but some of these other ones we can't really use. Um, oh, that was, these are my issues. Um, okay, so for our non-task specific uh, pre-processing, uh, we train a model to deal with the bad images. So, uh, so first we have labeled data where we went through a bunch of images and labeled whether or not they were bad or incomplete. Um, and RA uh, had labeled them. Um, and then we make a pre-trained model. So first we, use a, we make a pre-trained model using the cityscapes data set. Um, that just provides um, some more background on, some more information on what a city, what's that? Did someone say something? Oh yeah. Um, more information on, on cityscapes, um, streetscapes. Um, and then we use a ResNet model. Um, we use the ResNet 50 model, which is a pre-trained model. Um, on the ImageNet database, it has 50 layers, 1,000 object categories. Um, and then we do some transfer learning. So we're fine tuning these pre-trained models um, with our labeled data. Um, and then we're using that to predict, um, to train a classifier um, and predict on out of sample uh, images. Um, so we have to use high performance computing clusters and, um, in order to do this. I think with anything with segmentation, you, you have to. And so we just use the university's uh, remote GPUs, but you can also get your own, which are quite expensive. Um, okay. Then we segment the images into what's good or bad. Um, about 20% of images are actually pretty bad, um, and we eliminate those. Um, performance wise, um, in terms of precision, so this is the amount of images that are rated as bad, that are um, out of the ones that were predicted as bad, um, they're pretty high, right, over 90%. Um, recall are the amount of images that are predicted as bad, um, but are um, out of the amount of images that are actually bad, um, still over 90%. So these are, we think, pretty good, and if there's some inaccuracies that we lose, we still have a millions and millions of images um, left. Okay, collecting training data. Um, so once we have our database of images, we need to collect the data. Um, and this is really an iterative process, and this has really been probably occupying most of the time on this. Um, so one is determining the training sample. Um, so we need a subset of images that we want to train on. Um, and originally, we just took a, a random sample of images. Um, but what we found is that most images don't have any trash. We started with trash. Um, and so what we ended up doing was taking an oversample of images um, from high poverty neighborhoods. Not a great proxy for, um, not necessarily a strong proxy of trash, but we, were, we need variation in, um, you know, images have to have trash in order to predict trash. Um, so we wanted to oversample on trash, uh, on high poverty neighborhoods. Um, Currently, we're, our training sample is about 15,000 images, and we're evaluating whether or not we need more. Um, and then we have to develop the survey. So this is another thing. So MTurkers can only answer very specific questions or do very specific tasks. And so we had to do a lot of pre-testing on how we ask the question, um, 
whether or not they're producing consistent answers. Um, we pretest among our cell, like our project team, then we test on a few mTurkers, different batches to see what they, um, what they answer. And so there's this iterative process going on. Um, then we have to assess the results. So we need to see if, make sure the mTurkers are actually giving us right answers. Um, and then we have to test, and then once we assess those, we test on a larger batch. Um, so one thing we're doing with our training data collection is um, we're asking mTurkers pretty simple questions, and then um, we're running an algorithm called TrueSkill, which is essentially um, a way to deal with ranking um, the answers to questions. So we're asking them to compare two images, um, and then we run an algorithm that's used in gaming uh, to rank players, um, to give a continuous score of the ratings, and then we predict on, on use the ML to predict with that training data. Um, so we need to assess all of those and make sure they're producing what we want them to produce. Um, then we have to continue to adjust and then collect on a, full, a larger batch of training data. And then we have to reassess the results. So this is a really iterative process um, and has been more iterative than I had realized it would be. Um, so we use Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, has anyone ever used it? Okay, yeah, so you all, most of you know what it is. Um, it's just generally a platform um, that has a lot of workers. It's very popular, um, and you can um, enter, you can uh, add hits. So these are assignments that people do online. I'm using the wrong words. Um, but basically, you can put up a, a, a set of images that you want people to rate, and you pay them um, a fee for or you pay them for it. There's a pay rate. You can set the time that it will take them to do. Um, and you wanna, there's an art on how much you wanna pay versus how long it'll take to get people to do it. Um, currently, our current iteration of the trash surveys, um, are sent, we ask people if there's trash, yes or no. Um, we show them one image, or is it too obstructed? Um, so this, cre the too obstructed creates our um, labeled data for our second stage of pre-processing to get rid of those images that we can't judge if there's trash. Um, and then we just ask a yes or no question on whether or not there's trash. Um, and then the second stage is, a bi is the pairwise comparison. So we take everything with a yes, um, a consensus yes, um, and we have five raters each, rate each image. Um, anything with a questionable consensus, we also put into the yes, into the pairwise surveys. Um, and then we ask them to rate which image has more trash. Um, does anyone know the answer here? Yes, exactly. Um, so, well, wait, who said right? <laughs> Not <laughs> wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that one has more trash. And essentially, uh, the way it works is every image is, is rated but, um, with 18 other images. Um, and so that ensures some accuracy with the rankings. And then um, it creates this continuous distribution of, of trash levels in um, in an image. Um, the reason we're doing this and not having people rate images is because there's a lot of um, unreliability when it comes to ratings. Um, even, and we've seen this with our expert raters that I'll tell you about in a minute. But, um, so if you ask someone to rate an image with like one through four how much trash there is, like a lot of people, some people just give a lot of ones, some people just give a lot of fours, and there's a lot of inner rater reliability issues. And so this guarantees um, a more systematic way of uh, rating the images um, as well. Um, we also have tried different things. So we've tried where we started off with having people select trash um, on MTurk and people just stopped taking the survey because if you have to click on all of those, um, people just stop doing it. Um, and then conceptually, if we're interested in levels of trash, is it the size or the amount? Um, it, the interpretability is, is harder than thinking about levels. And so um, and we, so we also tried training, um, we also did it ourselves where we rated because the MTurkers weren't reliable, um, just to see if it improved the model and it didn't. So um, this is where we're at with, the, with this format. Um, and the reason we're doing the two-stage format is because most images don't have trash, so it saves money to do the yes, no, and then only run the pairwise among the images with trash. Um, Okay, um, so again, the, the labels for obstruction leaves us with, um, and then we, we take out the things with obstruction labels, and then we um, have 
a second stage pre-processing version. These are just some results from the Boston and Detroit um, training data. Um, so only about 2.6% are rated as too obstructed. 68% um, um, don't have trash, so those are filtered out. Uh, and only 3.7% have no consensus, even though we had five people rate each image. Um, it's pretty consistent on what has trash and what doesn't. Um, and then as you can see, Detroit had a lot more with trash, um, which it's a poorer city, might be expected. Um, trying to run out of time. So once we have these, these scores, we create um, the true skill scores, which are continuous. Mm -hmm. We then discre discretize them into categories. Um, this reflects like what the old surveys used to do, where you rate a little trash, some trash, a lot of trash. Um, and it's actually more interpretable when we're thinking about um, trash levels. Like a 22.3 and a 22.4 of a true skill score, there's really no difference in a lot of those. Um, and so even though the true skill creates this artificial, conti this continuous score, um, there really isn't much difference um, in, within different levels. Um, these are just some distributions. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but as you can see, Detroit has a lot more with trash. Um, and, and the distributions of the true skill scores vary by city, are particular to the city, so that's why another reason why we discretize them as well. Um, but as I mentioned, very few have trash um, levels. Okay, so the expert ratings. Um, so what we did was we created these coding sessions um, where we have Stanford students come in, we pay them an Amazon gift card, and they rate images, they go through a training module, um, and we use, originally they're, they're supposed to be the expert ratings, um, or what a human would do, um, and, but we've also come across issues there. Um, so there's some iterator reliability issues, um, as I had mentioned, uh, we also had to add in Attention checks, we, gave a, we have like a $2 bonus if you pass all of the random checks because we were, were, some of them were getting things wrong or actually being bad workers too. Um, and so there's about 64% agreement between coders, um, between those Stanford students. So we were like, why is this happening? Um, and then we looked at the agreement between the MTurkers and coders and there's actually a little bit more agreement there. Um, and then, uh, we also looked at the ratings um, versus true skill and the ML results. Um, and they're actually pretty good in Boston um, and Detroit, um, depending on what we're looking at um, when we're, once we discretize things. So even if the pairwise things, if the pairwise comparisons aren't rated perfectly um, in sync with each other, uh, the true skill scores actually turn out to be pretty decent, um, although LA, um, which is based on old data, um, wasn't very good. So we went through the images and tried to figure out what was wrong with everything or what was causing some of these issues. Um, these are just some various issues that came up. So some people are more prone to choosing neither than um, picking something, but other people like to pick something. So, and I think that's just like a personality thing, right? Um, and so those were causing some of the discrepancies. Um, some issues with difficult questions. So like, are those leaves um, or is it trash? Um, shadows were another issue. Um, whether or not trash is distributed versus clumped um, changed how people rated things. Uh, lighting was an issue. Um, confounders, right? So this is an unkempt lot, but there's no trash in it, but there's flowers in it, but it, people must it, we were mistaking that for trash. Um, a big issue was the instructions, so taking out your bin for trash. Um, we didn't have that in the first version, and so those images got rated as having the highest amount of trash. Um, and so that's not really disorder, so we then had to create these training modules um, and change the instructions um, and make it clear, do not pick these. Uh, we reassess the thresholds. Um, and so I think that brings another question is what is the ground truth, right? Our, the are humans the ground truth, um, and we want the computer to predict as well as that, um, or do we just, is that our benchmark for what was previously done? I'm running out of time, so I'll speed through the rest. Um, these are just some issues that have come up with buildings and frontage. Um, there's differences in whether or not you ask the question, is it, is it, does it have less maintenance or more maintenance? Um, 
Greenery has been another issue, so people tend to rate things better when there's greenery there. So we've worked on segmenting those, uh, taking, asking those as different surveys. Um, okay. So um, speeding through these, um, deep vision learning and assessment. So here we have the labeled MTurk data collection, and we're using pretty much the same process as, as we did for the pre-processing, um, transfer learning uh, with the ResNet. Um, and then we're using support vector regression to predict trash um, and, and trash levels. Um, we're also experimenting with predicting on the, the discretized categories that we created and then using those to use the SVR regression to pick on those. We've also predicted on the true scale continuous scores and then discretized them after. Um, and then we're also trying right now a, an end-to-end -end ResNet. Um, so this is all in one process. There's no SVR uh, support vector regression. And, and we're doing this so we can actually do some class activation mapping. Um, so what class activation mapping is, is it allows um, the CNN to both classify the image and specify which region of the image contributes to the prediction. So this, we're using this to see what is causing errors in, the, um, in our deep learning. So it highlights like what is contributing to the image. So here there's trash and it's correctly predicting trash and looking at the trash there. But here, this is just a mark in the road and it's, a human could say that that's not trash, right? But model prediction says there's trash. Um, and so this has been a really useful way to think about um, the, what's uh, going on um, in the, the deep learning. So here are just some accuracies. So um, they're pretty good, um, except that the, it's, it's good at predicting no trash because most of the images don't have trash, um, and it's only 65% accurate uh, at predicting when there's trash. Um, and so we're trying to work right now collecting more data and retraining the model. So this is based on our small training sets. Um, and then we're using the coding sessions to compare. So this is just a lot of, I think the point is that there's a lot of evaluation and that this isn't as objective as we um, thought would be happening as we went in. Um, and then figuring out what the ground truth is has been another issue. Um, these are just for building. So here's an example. Um, this is clearly a blighted building, but the, the model is mistaking those boarded up things as just regular doors, uh, and it's totally not seeing this. Um, and so that's predicting it as like a, a fair condition building rather than a blighted building. Um, so there's more to do here. We've only t tested this on a small sample um, of images. Um, eventually we want to scale, create these scales for physical disorder and decay and physical maintenance because these are the theoretical constructs that we want to measure in sociology, um, look at the differences in spatial aggregations, um, and then uh, check the reliabilities and external validity of those aggregate measures. Um, we've just sort of experimented with scaling um, with other cities. Uh, right now we're scraping um, Philadelphia and Austin. So Philadelphia is like visually similar to some of these cities and Austin, which is in the south in the US, should be different. So we think the model will predict poorly on Austin, not so good in Philadelphia. Um, and we've kind of just experimented with testing uh, accuracies when we test a couple cities on other cities, uh, on one of the other cities in our sample. Um, and as you can see, there's some variation, right? Um, like. LA is not very good at predicting on Detroit, uh, which makes sense because they're, they're very different looking cities. Um, and Detroit's not very good at predicting on LA. Um, and with all cities, uh, it's it's, that's sort of at the accuracies that we're at right now. Um, okay, so any ideas for future, uh, for me, for the future, um, future steps? It's a lot to take in, yeah. Think about subdividing LA. It's, it's 25 million inhabitants, right? And it's a highly diverse how it looks if you graduate the neighborhood. Yes. Um, yeah, we've been, because, right, some places have been looking very suburban, and if you're randomly picking images, people will rate the suburban one as better no matter what than the urban one. Um, that's a good idea. Um, it's not, it's only, fo we're only doing the city, but it's still mm -hmm. much larger. But yeah, we've been having, running into that issue. We right now are separating things with greenery versus not 
Um, but we haven't ran those yet. Hoping it helps. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, closing points, uh, visual data captures important dimensions of spatial context to better understand social environments. Um, big visual data allows us to answer sociological questions about urban environments across urban contexts and with more precision. Um, but big visual data comes with challenges for measuring theoretical constructs. Um, I think sociologists are very concerned with theoretical constructs and making sure they're accurately measured. Um, and so, like, you know, a 60% uh, reliability uh, might satisfy a computer scientist in prediction for some things, but that will not, I could not say that we, these neighborhoods have trash or not trash or, or good or physical disorder with that. Um, so those need to improve. Um, but I think with continuing advancements in this field, um, I think there's possibilities to overcome them. Um, these are just some discussion questions to think about um, as you're doing your own work. Thanks.